Greetings. This episode relates the Confederate incursion into Indiana by General John Hunt Morgan in July 1863. Confederate General John Hunt Morgan planned a raid across the Ohio River and sent a man named Thomas Hines to discover Confederate sympathizers in the Indiana that might support his raid. Hines and about a hundred men stole some Union soldier uniforms from a supply depot in Brownsville, Kentucky, then robbed a train to acquire Union currency. They crossed the river below Leavenworth. They used the ruse that they were Union troops searching for deserters as they struck to north towards Paoli, then to French Lick. Once there, they met with Dr. William A. Bowles, a Confederate supporter. Bowles told them he could not help them. Attempting to escape into Kentucky, they hired a guide from Leavenworth to take them across the river. Instead, the man betrayed them to Union troops that were chasing Hines down. The Union troops used ammunition supplied by Leavenworth residents to attack the Confederates as they attempted to cross the river. The soldiers killed three of them and captured most of the rest. Hines managed to escape. Brigadier General John Hunt Morgan, in an effort to draw Union troops away from their campaign in Tennessee crossed the Ohio River with over 2,000 trained and seasoned Confederate troops on July the 8th, 1863. Fresh off two raids in Kentucky that rattled Union commanders in the area, he defied orders from his superior General, G General Braxton Bragg by crossing the Ohio River into Indiana on July 8th and 9th, 1863. John Hunt Morgan lived from June the 1st, 1825 through September the 4th, 1864. The eldest of ten children born to Calvin and Henrietta Hunt Morgan, John's father migrated to Lexington, Lexington, Kentucky after the failure of his pharmacy. John attended Transylvania College, but the university tossed him out in 1844 for dueling. He enlisted in the Army in 1846 to serve in the Mexican-American War. He had an avid interest in the military and raised a unit in 1852, which the state legislature disbanded. When tensions began rising during the years before the Civil War, he raised another unit in 1857, which he trained well. When war broke out, he did not immediately favor secession, but when southern start states began seceding, he and his men joined the cause. Using his corps of Lexington riflemen as a nucleus, he soon used a unit, raised a unit, the 2nd Kentucky Cavalry Regiment. This unit fought at the Battle of Shiloh. On July the 4th, 1862, Morgan launched the first of his Kentucky raids. This successful action resulted in the capture of over a thousand federal troops and the requisitioning of tons of Union supplies and hundreds of horses. A second series of raid against Major General William S. Rosecrans supply lines disrupted Union troops and created havoc in the Union command in Kentucky. The success of these raids encouraged his foray into Indiana. Morgan launched his raid from Burksville, Kentucky, which is near the Tennessee-Kentucky state line. The beginning of this raid coincided with General Lee's Battle of Gettys Gettysburg far to the northeast. From Burksville, the troops rode north to Brandenburg, Kentucky. He had already scouted the Ohio to find suitable places to cross and had settled on this site. His soldiers commandeered two riverboats on July the 7th, and by the next day they moved north towards Corydon, and the only Civil War battle to occur on Indiana soil. Indiana Home Guard units and two Union gunboats accept, attempted to stop this crossing, but they were not successful. Morgan's Raiders, as the Confederates have come to be called, included about eight Kentucky regiments, one Tennessee cavalry unit, two howitzers, and two Parrot guns. Historians estimate the number of Confederates at about 2,100 soldiers. Designed by Army Captain Robert Parker Parrot in 1860, the Parrot gun saw extensive use by both Confederate and Union forces during the Civil War. A type of muzzle-loading rifle, rifled artillery weapon, the weapon was accurate but the subject to shattering when fired. Thus, artillerists did not like it. The field version came in at 10 and 20 pounds. Morgan probably had the smaller, lighter 10-pound version. Their extreme short-range accuracy made them effective weapon for troops on the move. The howitzer was a short-barreled gun that fired an explosive charge. Useful for use against a concealed enemy, the howitzer were mainly used for support of cavalry and infantry troops. General John Hunt Morgan's orders from his superior, General Jack Braxton Bragg, could not have been more explicit. His orders stated, quote, Go ahead and raid Kentucky. Capture Louisville if you can, but do not, I repeat, do not cross the river. Stay in Kentucky. 
go anywhere you want in your home state, but I command you to stay south of the river, unquote. Morgan never intended to follow these orders. He had sent Confederate Captain Thomas Hines ahead a few weeks before to scout southern Indiana. He hoped to find southern sympathizers called Copperheads and recruits for the Confederate Army. Hines had escaped Indiana, closely pursued by Union soldiers, and his report should have discouraged Morgan. It did not. Morgan launched his raid from Burksville. He sent an advance guard of his cavalry troop to prepare for the crossing. This advance guard reached Brandenburg, Kentucky on July the 7th. It found the riverboat J.T. McCombs, which had docked at Brandenburg to deliver and take on mail. The Confederates captured it and sailed to the center of the river. Once at midstream, they raised a distress flag, luring another of the riverboat, the Alice Dean, to its aid. They also captured this boat. They returned to Kentucky shore to await Morgan's troops. Morgan and his cavalry arrived on July the 8th. They began loading the boats around 9 o'clock a.m. It took 17 hours to transfer his troop of 2,500 cavalry across the river. Colonel John Timberlake of the Harrison County Home Legion's 100 men stood on the Indiana shore ready to oppose the Confederates. The Home Guard had cannon, which they had hauled up from Crawford County. As the Confederates approached, Timberlake, Timberlake shouted a warning to them. When the warning had no effect, Timberlake ordered his cannon to open fire. The gun fired three times. The first overshot the boat and the village of Brandenburg. The second wounded a Confederate officer. The third shark shot went wide also. Man and ha Morgan had two cannon mounted on the hills above Brandenburg. These cannon returned to Union fire, destroying a log cabin and scattering the untested Union troops. The Home Guard regrouped in a thicket but were pinned down by Confederate gunfire. The Confederates could now return to ferrying troops across the river. A Union gunboat appeared, the Springfield. Armed with 24 guns, the Springfield fired on the Confederates on both sides of the river. The Confederate cannon and rifles returned fire. After an hour-long duel, the Springfield, afraid of being sunk, retreated. The Springfield returned later, accompanied by a steamboat called the Gray Eagle. The Gray Eagle had a regiment of troops on board as well as several cannon. A cannon duel ensued from which the Union boats inexplicably withdrew. They never returned, losing the chance to stop Morgan's raid before it began. Morgan's troops on the Indiana side moved fast soon capturing most of the inexperienced home guards. After securing a promise from them not to take up arms against him again, Morgan released them and moved on to Corydon. Before leaving the river, Morgan had the Alice Dean set afire. It sank in the river near the mouth of Buck Creek. A troop of a force of about 400 Indiana militia and citizen volunteers, commanded by Colonel Lewis Jordan engaged John Morgan's troops, raiders, in the Battle of Corydon on July the 8th, 1863. Morgan deployed his 2,400 cavalry. Sorry, the number keeps changing, but I don't think they really know exactly how many he had. Uh, anyway, he deployed his 2,400 cavalrymen along a wooded ridge a mile south of Corydon. The Hoosier defense caused General Duke, Morgan's second-in-command, to comment, quote, they resolutely defended their rail, rail piles, unquote. Three Hoosiers and eight Confederates were killed in the battle. Morgan then brought up his cannon and flanked the militia, forcing Jordan to retreat. After Morgan surrounded and began shelling Corydon, Jordan surrendered with all his men. After the battle, residents of Corydon used the Presbyterian Church on Walnut Street as a hospital. When the re Confederates recovered from their wounds, the residents released them to travel back south. Morgan pardoned his prisoners after he departed, after extracting a promise that they would not attack him or his men again. Although considered a Confederate victory, the outnumbered Hoosiers delayed Morgan long enough to allow Union forces to close in on in their pursuit. During the remainder of the raid, Union forces would dog Morgan, keeping him, keeping him on the move until his eventual capture in Ohio. Uh, you can find the site of the battle at the Battle of Corydon Memorial Park, 100 Old Highway 135 Southwest, Corydon, Indiana. On the web, if you go to www.harrisoncountyparks.com, there's a link to the park. Word of Brigadier General Hunt Morgan's crossing the river into Indiana, into Indiana spread fast over the state. Rumors placed a number of Morgan's troops at over 6,000. Morgan had expected that many Hoosiers would rally to his cause. Instead, the news set off, set off a firestorm of activity as men scrambled to enlist in the Union Army to defend their homes. Thirteen regiments formed quickly. 
that would have been 65,000 men about. They uh, formed quickly into Minutemen temporary units formed in response to the threat. The regiments included in Indiana re regiments number 102nd through the 114th. Most of these regiments went in pursuit of the elusive Morgan and then disbanded when the threat ended. Morgan didn't rest after his victory at Corydon. He continued east, crossing Harrison, Washington, Scott, Jennings, Jefferson, Ripley, and Dearborn counties. Corydon's town people cared for Morgan's wounded soldiers from the battle, using the old Presbyterian church as a hospital. From Harrison County, he crossed Washington County and then entered Scott County. A marker notes the route Morgan's Raid as it passed through the county. Title of marker, Morgan's Raid, July 1863, Vienna. Location, 0.2 miles east of the junction of U.S. 31 and State Road 356, Louisville and Indiana Railroad, south side of Highway, Vienna. Marker text, side one. During the Civil War, Confederate General John Hunt Morgan led a raid through southern Indiana, July the 8th through the 13th, 1863. Crossed Ohio River at Brandenburg, Kentucky on two commandeered steamboats with over 2,000 cavalrymen and entered Indiana near Mockport. Following a battle at Corydon, they traveled north to Salem. Side 2. Morgan's soldiers then traveled east and reached Vienna on July the 10th. They burned railroad bridges and depot and tapped telegraph lines. Spent the night in Lexington. Moving northeast, they interacted with towns including Vernon, DuPont, and Versailles. They left Indiana at Harrison, now West Harrison. Morgan and part of his force were captured in eastern Ohio. The John Hunt Morgan Heritage Trail follows the approximate route as he crossed the state from east from west to east. I will describe this route briefly and at the end give information how you can obtain a map and more information. After the Battle of Corydon, Morgan and his men rode east into Indiana. They reached Vienna, Indiana on July the 10th. They burned a railroad bridge and cut telegraph wires. From Vienna, they moved on to Vernon, Indiana after spending the night in Lexington. A marker in Vernon notes the event. Title of marker, Mark Morgan's Raid, location, southwest corner of Courthouse Square, Vernon. Marker text, during the Civil War, Confederate General John Hunt Morgan led a raid into southern Indiana, July the 8th through the 13th, 1863. On July 11th, he demanded the surrender of Vernon. Colonel Hugh T. Williams, Indiana Legion, replied that, quote, Morgan must take it by hard fighting. No major battle occurred, and Morgan's cavalry withdrew towards DuPont, Jefferson County. The John Hunt Morgan Heritage Trail enters Jennings County from Scott County as it follows Indiana State Road 3. It proceeds to Vernon. Morgan approached Vernon from the Paris, Indiana, and Union troops had positioned themselves to defend the Madison and Indiana Railroad and the Ohio and Mississippi Railroad. The town of Vernon was evacuated under threat from Morgan that he would shell the town. During the night, a shot caused a great deal of excitement among the refugees. In the morning, the cause was found to be a soldier that discharged his weapon accidentally when he slipped and fell. From Vernon, Morgan slipped away towards DuPont, Indiana, and Jefferson County. Morgan thought that the Union forces in the area outnumbered his, so he did not fight. He was wrong in this assumption, as his force was numeric numerically superior. From Vernon, the trail goes southwest on Indiana State Road 7 to the town of DuPont in Jefferson County. From Jefferson County, he entered the north from Scott Jennings County. He entered northwest corner of Jefferson County near the hamlet of DuPont. The John Hunt Morgan Trail, which approximates Morgan's route, enters Jefferson County from Jennings County as it follows Indiana State Road 7. It turns west at the town of DuPont on County Road 1050 north then south to skirt Big Oaks National Wildlife Refuge. Morgan, of course, went due east from this point, but the trail now has to skirt what was formerly, and a portion still is, a U.S. military base. The trail rejoins Indiana State Road 7 for about 2.7 miles before turning east again on County Road 400 north, which it follows for about 3 miles at its intersection with U.S. 421 north. The trail turns north on U.S. 421 for about 8.2 miles as it enters Ripley County. Points of interest 16 and 17 are located in Jefferson County. The Ripley County portion of the trail begins at historic marker at the intersection of U.S. Route 421 and Michigan Road in southeastern Indiana. Tour visitors will see a large pull-off at the intersection. The kiosk has an informational markers for the Big Oaks National Wildlife Refuge, which is on the other side of the fence. 
The historical marker from Morgan's Raid is in the parking lot on the west side. From this point, the trail leads north on Michigan Road. At New Marion, the tour turns east on County Road 450 South, turn right on County Road 450 and drive to U.S. Route 421, turn left, which is north. U.S. 421 becomes Adams Street in Versailles. Follow Adams, U.S. 421 into Versailles. At the intersection of U.S. 421 and U.S. Route 50, proceed straight on Adams Street to Tyson Street and turn right. Uh, he next attack, he uh, next threatened the courthouse in Ripley County. Uh, the construction of the first courthouse in Versailles occurred in 1821 in the center of the town square. This building required replacement by the 1860s. The county began construction of a new building during the years 1860 through 1863. The Civil War slowed down construction on the building. The courthouse was the target of John Hunt Morgan's Civil War raid in 18, July 1863. Organization of a militia to defend the town was undertaken. It disbanded in the face of Morgan's far superior and better armed force. Morgan had a, over 2,000 troops and a cannon. He threatened to use a cannon on the newly completed courthouse in Versailles if any of the natives resisted his troops. Morgan's troop confiscated the county treasury, food, possessions, and livestock. Turn right from here on Washington Street and proceed to its intersection with U.S. Route 50. Turn left. This leg passes Versailles State Park just outside of Versailles. At the intersection of U.S. 50 and, inter and Indiana State Road 129, turn left, north. Continue driving on to the intersection with Indiana State Road 350 and turn right, which is east. The next marker is in Pierceville at the Pierceville Post Office, and that one's entitled Union News Tightening. Continue on State Road 350 to County Road 550, turn left, and then drive to County Road 475 north. Turn right and drive to its intersection with Indiana State Road 101, turn left. Continue driving north on Indiana State Road 101, crossing Indiana State Road 48 and Niggin Guards Corner. About a mile north of this intersection, St. Paul Lutheran Church comes into view. The next marker, exhausted Union troops, is across from this church overlooking the cemetery. Uh, Morgan camped overnight in that cemetery. It wasn't a cemetery at the time. It was a, it was a field, I guess. From here, cross State Road 101 to take County Road 900 north, which is Ash Road, east past the cemetery. A short distance from this point, the trail enters Dearborn County. John Hunt Morgan's raiding Confederate troops crossed the northern section of Dearborn County on July the 13th, 1863. There are four historical markers placed by the Hoosier Hills, Ho Historic Hoosier Hills Organization along this route. Signs 21, 22, 23, and 24 are the easternmost signs in Indiana relating to the raid. John Hunt Morgan and his troops entered Dearborn County on County Road 900 North slash Ash Road from its junction with Indiana State Road 101 south of Sunman, Indiana. The route continues east on Ash Road to its junction with Wuliang Road just east of the small town of Weisberg. Wuliang Road intersects Graff Road at a T. Turn right on Graff Road and continue on it until you reach the North Dearborn Road in the valley or in the village of New Alsace. Turn right on North Dearborn Road to its intersection with Jamison Road. Turn left on Jamison Road. There are markers at the Old West Harrison School. From here, Morgan left Indiana and entered Ohio. Morgan's raiders, as a small army came to be known, spent six days pillaging, looting, and burning across seven southern Indiana counties before crossing the state line and invading Ohio. Morgan tried to cross the Ohio River at Buffington Island. He was intercepted by Union gunboats and forces. Some of his force managed to escape into West Virginia. About 750 were captured. Morgan and about 300 remaining men fled into northeastern Ohio. They were captured near West Point, Ohio, on July the 26th. John, the John Hunt Morgan uh, Trail, uh, you can get more information at the website www.hhhills.org. And they've got a uh, link on there to John Hunt Morgan. Uh, the trail. And for more information, you can also contact the Dearborn County Visitor Center, 320 North Walnut, 320 Walnut Street, Lawrenceburg, Indiana, 47025. You can phone 812-537-0814. And uh, their website is www.visitsoutheastindiana.com. The next episode takes uh, the timeline from the end of Morgan's Raid up until 
the uh, final encampment of the Grand Army of the Republic after the Civil War. Find out more about Indiana's role in the Civil War by purchasing my book. You can find it on the website, www.mossyfeetbook.com, on the Indiana Short History Series category. There are links to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Google Play, and other online booksellers. You may choose to purchase the book in ebook or softbound versions. An audiobook version is also available on Google Play. At the conclusion of this podcast series, I will compile the episodes into an audiobook. The audiobook will be available on Audible, Amazon, Apple, Barnes & Noble, as well as many other audiobook sellers. You can listen to this podcast on many platforms, including Apple, TuneIn, Spotify, Amazon Music, and many others. Video versions are available on YouTube and Rumble. Southeast Indiana residents can also find my books at the Walnut Street Variety Shop at 111 George Street in Batesville, Indiana. You can also order these books direct from me, the author, on the webpage. If you wish me to sign the book, just send an email to mossyfeetbooks at gmail.com at mossyfeetbooks at gmail.com requesting a signed book and instruction on how you want me to address it. Note, if you send me an email, I will add you to my contact list. Readers on the list will receive an email from me announcing when I publish a new book. If you do not want me to add you to the list, tell me and I will not add you. Listeners to this podcast that want email notifications of my new releases can just send an email requesting addition to the list. You can choose to have your name removed at any time. If you browse the website, you will find dozens of sample chapters, one for each of my books. I hope you enjoyed this podcast, and thank you for listening.